Great. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to discuss the national security imperative of a secure information communications technology supply chain. I'm Tatiana Bolton, the Managing Senior Fellow for R Street Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats Team. The R Street Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization. And our mission is to engage in public policy research and outreach to promote free markets and limited effective government. We're pleased to co-host this event with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. FDD is a Washington DC based nonpartisan research institute focused on national security and foreign policy. FDD's Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation seeks to advance US prosperity and security through technology innovation while countering cyber threats that seek to diminish it. Earlier this fall, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission issued a white paper examining US critical dependencies on key materials and technologies that make up the ICT supply chain. The commission concluded that the United States needs a strategy to ensure more trusted supply chains and the availability of critical information and communications technology. We are pleased to be joined today by Representative Mike Gallagher, who serves as the co-chair of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, to talk about the commission's findings and the next phase of work to develop this strategy. Uh, he is an expert on cybersecurity, and we're so pleased to have him here today. After the Congressman's opening remarks, he and Jill Itoro, the editorial director at Cyber Risk Alliance and the editor-in-chief of SC Media, will delve deeper into the topic as well as you, about US concerns about China. Then we're gonna turn the conversation over to our expert panelists to talk about critical technologies and materials, partnerships with US allies, and the military implications of a lack of security in our ICT supply chain, and discuss the launch of our new Secure and Competitive Markets Initiative. So Congressman Gallagher, over to you. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you today. And um, I am certainly uh, not an expert in, in cybersecurity, though I've had the privilege of working with a lot of um, actual experts over the last couple of years as part of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, uh, including Tatiana, uh, who did phenomenal work uh, as part of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission staff and, and Mark Montgomery and a few others that I know are part of this. And let me just first say at the outset how much I support this multi-think tank uh, effort, uh, a multi-think tank look at uh, industrial policy, because I really think it's going to require uh, best and brightest from a variety of institutions in the think tank community to come up with creative uh, solutions uh, in this space. And I think we're very much at the beginning of, of a big initiative on this. Uh, so just quickly to talk about the uh, commission's work and the state of the commission, uh, our first year I think was a resounding success. My, my co-chair, Senator Angus King and I are very proud of the team effort that produced our, our March report, which included 82 policy and legislative recommendations. We also completed four white papers that looked at specific issues and produced some additional recommendations, um, you know, one of which was inspired by lessons learned from the pandemic and, and others. Um, I expect to see, I mean, I'm, I, in about an hour and a half, I'm going to a, an NDAA meeting for the conferees, but I expect to see about 25 of these legislative recommendations in the upcoming National Defense Authorization Act, including some of our most significant recommendations. And we really hope uh, to work for, uh, for a second year in, in um, in 2021 and, and put some of our recommendations uh, in front of the 117th Congress that we weren't able to get passed in, in this Congress. Um, Senator King and I had one consistent goal throughout the process uh, and that, you know, uh, was, uh, and this was really a, a bipartisan and, and, and nonpartisan uh, effort. We wanted to maintain it uh, as a bipartisan uh, effort. And honestly, if you had just come to any one of our meetings with a blindfold on, uh, just listening to the, the the substance of what was being discussed, you wouldn't have been able to determine who was Democrat and, and who was Republican. And we also have very good engagement from the executive branch as well. And that really we thought was a unique um, asset of our commission was just the, the unique makeup, having four sitting legislators, uh, high level members of the executive branch, and then a group of outside experts, I think, really made for a thoughtful debate and thoughtful recommendations. And so we really hope that you'll uh, read not only the supply chain white paper, but also the broader work of the the commission. Uh, just quickly, when it comes to supply chain strategy, you know, obviously I came here today to speak 
about the one of the four white papers I mentioned, the most recent white paper uh, on the need to develop a strategy to protect our critical technology supply chain. And to put it bluntly, um, in the context of supply chains for ICT, the United States has a China problem. Uh, China has mobilized state-owned and state-influenced companies to grab dominant positions in markets for many emerging technologies, uh, including the market for ICT equipment. Um, as a result of Chinese state intervention, the playing field is uneven uh, and global markets for critical technologies are neither free uh, nor fair. And uh, while China has a comprehensive strategy, the United States lacks an overarching vision for how to compete with China on this front. And as a result, the US has a growing dependency on China for parts of our most critical supply chains one that's threatening to undermine the trustworthiness and the availability of critical technologies and components that constitute and connect to cyberspace um, and potentially impede American and partner companies' competitiveness in global markets. Um, so what the commission is proposing uh, is that any strategy to secure the United States high-tech supply chains must be built on a foundation of strong partnership with industry at home and abroad, as well as partner and allied governments and must rest on five key pillars. Uh, the first is that it must identify key materials, components and finished products that are critical to the national and economic security of the United States through a risk-based approach. The second is that it must leverage instruments of capitalism and investment to ensure minimum viable manufacturing capacity of critical components and technologies. The third is it must leverage existing and new efforts to provide greater government support to industry and to protect supply chains from compromise. Uh, the fourth is that it must outline ways for the US government to facilitate a domestic market for finished technologies. And the fifth is that it must outline ways for the US government to ensure the competitiveness of US and partner companies in global markets. Um, if you kind of step back, I think you know the ability of Chinese manufacturers to undercut competitors has led to a growing web of Chinese technologies and critical systems from telecommunications networks to power grids to ports, and not just in the United States, uh, all around the world. And the challenge facing the United States is therefore complex. It's multifaceted, uh, multifaceted. It involves equal parts economics and security, but without an ICT industrial base strategy, uh, America risks falling behind competitively and, and leaving its citizens at, at serious risk. And, Maybe I'll just conclude by saying, I know um, at times it's been um, uh, verboten to even use the term uh, industrial strategy or industrial base strategy, but I, I, I say this as someone who represents um, a district in Northeast Wisconsin that's very heavy manufacturing and agriculture. Um, it's been my experience, uh, limited though it may be over the last four years that I, I think most Americans welcome a discussion about how we onshore, nearshore, reshore uh, American manufacturing. And I think that the challenge we have is to do that in a way that avoids, you know, devolving into complete autarky, right? We can't build everything in the United States. But certainly when it comes to key ICT technology, I think your average common sense American, whether they're a Democrat or Republican, would welcome a, a thoughtful discussion uh, about that and, and understands intuitively the stakes here, particularly having just emerged or, or gone through um, a pandemic where you had Chinese Communist Party officials threatening to cut off the exports of critical drugs and medical devices in order to hurt um, and kill uh, Americans. So I think, I think there's an opportunity we have here um, to harness that recognition um, and to do something that will be uh, not only good for our domestic economy, but essential for our national security. So I thank every uh, person that's involved in this effort, the, the variety of think tanks that are participating in it. And uh, I look forward to uh, stealing all of your good ideas and copying and pasting them into legislative language as I've done successfully with Tatiana and Mark's work over the last uh, two years. Terrific. Thank you so much, Congressman. I really do appreciate, I'm sure everyone here appreciates the comments. And I think we're going to transition, if you don't mind, into um, some quick Q&A. Um, I'd like to actually touch on 
a couple of the areas that you covered and go a little deeper, starting with the NDAA, which all eyes are on NDAA right now. Um, it seems like if all moves forward and um, there are no vetoes, which have come up in the, in the last day or two, um, that we might kind of be in that final run. You did mention there are a number of provisions tied to cyber. Would you mind talking just about a couple of the most notable in your eyes um, that you see have, having good bipartisan support? Well, yeah, I think the, um, the perhaps um, most important and uh, simultaneously most contentious is this idea of, uh, well, two things. I'd say one is, is continuity of the economy planning. I mean, if you read our original Solarian report, you see this idea that is inspired from the early days of the, uh, the old Cold War, where really we had uh, a lot of experts um, in government think through the unthinkable of how would the United States survive and, and get back on track in the wake of a, a devastating nuclear exchange. And from that discussion emerged our plans for continuity of government and continuity of operations. Um, we sort of uh, concluded that we need a similar effort for how do we recover economically in the wake of a, a massive uh, cyber attack and make sure we're doing that planning now on the front end uh, so that we're not trying to make it up uh, on the fly. And I would go further and say one of the things that we learned um, or that we, we talked about in our, our pandemic white paper, pandemic annex or panex as the uh, cool kids are calling it on the streets, um, is, is, is really that you need the, the planning and the processes and the structure in place prior to the crisis in order to effectively navigate uh, the crisis. Uh, so that sort of continuity of the economy planning is critical. Um, the second thing I'd say is the creation of a, a national uh, cyber uh, director. Uh, and we spent a ton of time looking at a variety of different models for how you to uh, quote my, my good friend Angus King have, have one throat to choke in cyber and um, while there are strengths and weaknesses to different models we included we concluded that a national cyber director modeled after the u.s trade representative was uh the best option or or at least the least uh, bad option and i know there's there's been a robust debate with the executive branch about that but we feel very good about where the proposal landed and um i am cautiously optimistic that we're going to advance in that direction and then the final thing uh, it may sound simple, I know I said two, but I keep adding them in my mind, um, is uh, requiring a force structure assessment uh, for our cyber mission forces. Um, you know, their current structure is based on assessments that were, you know, done uh, years ago. Uh, the world has changed significantly since then. And while I don't want to prejudge the outcome of a future force structure assessment, I would suspect that when we do it, we're going to realize that we need to um, radically uh, alter our the structure and size of our, our cyber mission forces uh, in order to protect the country in cyberspace. So those three things, so those three things really stand out. But there's a variety of other uh, proposals. So so we'll see. I, I'm a conferee, but um, there are limits to what I know about what has made it in the final bill. So I'm anxiously awaiting this this meeting at 5 p.m. to see what our our batting average is. And if you don't think we're competitive, we actually had outside experts review the work of all past commissions, determine how successful they were in getting uh, their proposals into uh, law. And we want to beat the, uh, the historical average by, by a wide margin. We're, we're operating under Vince Lombardi rules here. We're not like that. chasing perfection. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw one more out at you to see if you have any thoughts or comments in terms of support. And I know that there was um, talk of potentially having um, the ability to subpoena internet service providers for information about vulnerabilities of the critical infrastructure. It somewhat ties to the conversation we're having today. Any thoughts on that in terms of bipartisan or GOP support for that? Well, I would say our um, uh, the work we did in, in the pandemic annex uh, really underscored or, or reemphasized the need for not only um, such uh, authority, uh, but also to uh, enhance penalties for, um, for those who try and attack our critical infrastructure in the midst of a crisis, uh, pandemic, uh, or otherwise. Uh, what the current state of play is legislatively on those, um, I don't know, quite honestly, but I do think we had, while there was a lot of different jurisdictional issues among the committees, at least within the commission, 
there was widespread support. And for the committees we reached out to, they, and you can look at the hearing that we did with um, uh, HISGAC uh, and others, uh, there was, there, I think there was a, a decent amount of bipartisan recognition of the need for such subpoena authority. But I'm sure your expert panel will correct me if I, if I'm wrong in that assessment after this. <laughs> Great. Um, and I do, um, while we have a few minutes here, I do want to touch, of course, on China. Um, as you mentioned, and you use that, that powerful quote that the commission wrote in the white paper in October um, in terms of, to put it bluntly, the U.S. has a China problem. Um, is this, I mean, first to kind of clarify or pinpoint the problem, do you define this as a military, competitive, economic, or all-encompassing in terms of the specific you issue we have with ICT supply chain security? Well, I, I define it, I mean, uh, if the question is whether it's uh, sort of what, what is the nature of the China problem itself, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's primarily, and I'm speaking, this is Mike Gallagher and, and not necessarily the views of, of the commission, because I have some views on China that I'm not sure the rest of the commissioners would agree to. Um, I mean, I'm right and they're wrong, but that's a discussion for another day. I view it primarily as a Chinese Communist Party problem. Um, and certainly the Chinese Communist Party is not, um, you know, recognizing any division between, you know, economic instruments of their power, military instruments of their power or otherwise. I mean, you know, whether it's the idea of civil military fusion or otherwise, or whether it's just the basic reality that, you know, state champions work for the state, uh, even Chinese companies that try and maintain the fiction that they're not beholden to the Chinese Communist Party um, are. Uh, there are laws on the books in China that uh, force them to share all of their information with the party. Uh, I think we need to recognize that that is sort of the way the, pop, the, the party is operating in a holistic fashion uh, with a desire to dominate all of these industries and eventually then flip the script on us when it comes to export controls and coerce American companies and other companies into obeying um, sort of their rules. Uh, so that's, that's point one. And then I think if you recognize that, then it leads to point two, which is that we need to, okay, we don't need to, we, we can't and we shouldn't try and out, you know, CCP, the CCP, but we are going to have to do a better job of breaking down barriers and stovepipes that exist within the federal government and thinking about this not just as a, a military problem or an economic problem or, or a diplomatic uh, problem. And then leveraging what is our unique strength relative to the CCP, which is that we don't have sort of a top-down, you know, rigid hierarchical model. We have a very open uh, entrepreneurial model and really, you know, we have a model in which the private sector is on, on the front lines. And I'd say this is something that we struggle with uh, throughout the commission's work, which is that when you have a situation in which 80% of the uh, critical infrastructure in cyberspace is, is concentrated in um, the private sector, uh, what is the role of the federal government? And how do you convince the federal government in general and the intelligence community in particular to really move to a model of, of being a, a reliable and trusted partner with the private sector, sharing information proactively with the private sector rather than just demanding that they uh, submit information and offering expertise in areas where the private sector really can't um, uh, provide it. And so I'm not saying that we arrived at a, a perfect balance, but we really did our best to ensure that we weren't imposing onerous one size fits all government mandates on the private sector, but we're instead trying to incentivize the private sector to prioritize private, uh, to prioritize cybersecurity, uh, and also spur the federal government to get interested in areas where uh, it currently is not doing enough. And the final thing I'd say, and again, this is going outside the commission's work, is I have come to believe, uh, although this relates to a lot of the the original cyber uh, uh, Solarium Commission report that it is long past time for a dramatic investment in research and development from the federal government, particularly in the ICT technologies that the uh, white paper identifies. The fact is you're gonna need some federal government investment, federal government partnership with academia in order to get innovation in these areas where there's just no natural market right now or for a variety of reasons, the private sector is just unwilling to step up. I actually have a bill, if you can believe it, with. 
uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, and then, uh, you know, a, a very progressive uh, member of the House, uh, Ro Khanna, uh, called the Endless Frontiers Act, which would make the biggest investment in research and development uh, from the federal government uh, since the, the original Cold War. And, um, you know, there's no other issue that can unite me and Chuck Schumer uh, like uh, the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party. Well, and you bring up an important point because this has long been talked about as, you know, what you might call an unfunded mandate uh, for the critical infrastructure scenario. And then you also have the technology companies, which of course have a huge role in this because particularly um, in terms of some of the components from uh, computer components all the way down to some of the defense and weapons systems, you really need that development happening in the industrial base. But all of that does require R&D funding. So it is often difficult to mandate these sorts of prior, the prioritization for both critical infrastructure, private companies, as well as the industrial base without the funding or the guarantee that there is a return on that investment. Do you Could I follow up to that real quick too? Absolutely. I mean, one of the areas we talk about in the paper is that, you know, for, for weapon systems in particular, obviously a lot of those, you know, so I work on, on Navy issues a lot um, uh, and I was, uh, I'm a Marine in a past life. I mean, a lot of these weapon systems, which we spend billions of dollars on, rely on rare earth elements um, yes. for, in order to function. And why is it that we can't seem to wean ourselves off dependency on China and rare earths when we know that we have processing capability, we have allies like Australia with huge assets in this regard. You know, the, the Japanese had a huge rare earth find a, a few years ago. Obviously it's more complex, you know, you gotta figure out a way to, to get all the stuff and process it, but there's gotta be a way in which with, it, with that investment from the federal government or overall direction, we can get the private sector act actors both in America and in our allied uh, countries, particularly in Five Eyes allied countries, to start working together. And the final thing I'd say that your question made me think of is, you know, for the past four years, we've really been we've been approaching the the five G discussion, for example, uh, from a purely defensive standpoint. It's it's really boiled down to you know Huawei's bad, ZTE's bad, Huawei's bad, ZTE's bad. And I believe that. And that's been a very important discussion for us to have internationally. And I think the Trump administration deserves enormous credit for successfully making that argument to allies uh, like the Brits who were not initially inclined to believe it and some of the progress we hope we're making in Germany and other countries. But that's only half the battle. Like we have to go on offense and come up with some sort of free world integrated solution where we can compete with the Huawei's and the ZTs of the world, not just on quality, but also a little bit on price. And so that's kind of where I would hope we, we go uh, going forward and build off some of the things we've done in the Armed Services Committee to incorporate foreign countries like Australia officially into our national technological industrial base. Yeah, and I wanted, there are a couple of questions coming in. I am gonna to get to, I wanna ask one more of my own, however. Um, it again relates to China in terms of, you know, so much of this does also rely not just on the US, but on um, allies and support from allies. And China has been very strategic and quite successful in garnering support, Pacific, particularly in the Pacific from countries there, often using economic means, luring through economic means. So how do we rally allies, not only to support the standards, for example, that the US is pushing out, but to also kind of pull some of the middle of the road allies, so to speak, to come towards the US um, and NATO in terms of where they align, um, despite some of the big promises that they're hearing from China? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I think in some ways it is, it is the question. Um, I think we have two, two opportunities. Um, well, potentially three. Uh, so first, I actually think if you look at what's happening, well, what's been happening in Australia really since the start of the pandemic, but over the last two years and, and really gained steam in, in the last week. I mean, it's just, it's brazen economic uh, coercion, you know, personal attacks, uh, you know, on, you know, the prime minister and others. I actually think this is a scenario in which, you know, wolf warrior diplomacy is, is backfiring. By the way, I, my, probably the, the most fun thing I did during the pandemic while trapped in my basement was to watch the actual Wolf Warrior one and two movies, which you can do on YouTube. And I, I find them to be quite insightful. I think Wolf Warrior two is the highest grossing 
Chinese film uh, of all time. And they both are just amazing in their caricature of Americans. Oh, and yeah. uh, you know, they make sort of like a Michael Bay movie look like a subtle work of art uh, in comparison. But I do think uh, around the world, uh, the Wolf Warrior diplomats have been overplaying their hand. I think people are waking up to just how aggressive and, and brazen this is. And so simply by, by sending a strong signal of support to our closest allies, the Aussies in particular, I saw an incoming Biden administration official did that today, which I thought was a good move. Uh, so that's sort of step one. And you know that's the, the lowest hanging fruit, just aggressively defending our traditional allies. Joe Courtney and I have done a lot uh, chairing the Friends of Australia Caucus uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, the second area, you know, our, our advantage, rel I mean, I get that the Chinese market is massive. There's a lot of money you can make there, but you know, what we offer uh, relative to that is, I mean, a huge market and a market that's actually bigger once you start adding in our uh, formal treaty allies alone, I think comprise upwards of 42% of the world's GDP. Um, but we offer transparency uh, and rule of law and, and we can be you know, that unique actor that, that sets the terms of, of what a free and fair system uh, looks like. And I think we really need to make ourselves uh, the economic and security partner of choice. And, and, and I hate to say it, but I think in a lot of these very obscure standard setting bodies around the world, uh, we've, we just haven't shown up uh, aggressively enough in recent years. And, and the CCP has, uh, and, you know, it may not be as sexy as, as some of the other stuff we do, but that diplomatic engagement, I think, matters. And it's part of the reason, this is the final thing I'd say, in the final report, you'll see, we've, we've done a lot to try and uh, enhance positions within the State Department that, that deal with these issues, really positions across the interagency, which, you know, don't get as much attention, but are, but are really, really important. You know, I was talking with someone um, the other day in the administration about, you know, who in the government is, is paying attention to sort of the, to Australia's first island chain, all these, all these countries like Vanuatu, where if we just had like one person there, it could go a long way. And we may not think that's important, but it is, it adds up. And so we've tried to think through kind of how do you enhance the diplomatic instruments of American power that would, that would help, you know, to make this argument to allies. Um, and for, and sorry to go on, uh, for the countries that are, you know, not Five Eyes allies, not aligned, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think we have an opportunity with, with Vietnam right now. Um, you know, certainly it's it's remarkable the you know the the positive view of Americans among, among the Vietnamese people. Uh, you know, I think the administration's done a good job recently building, enhancing ties uh, with India. You know, I think particularly in the wake of, you know, Chinese soldiers bludgeoning Indian soldiers to death. Um, you know, I did not have like hand to hand combat between China and India on my 2020 bingo card. So. I don't know. There's a lot of opportunities where we can make inroads with with non-aligned countries too. Yeah, yeah, it's terrific. I know there's a lot of domestic focus on growing their own industrial base. So having them in alignment with the United States is, is critical. There are a couple of questions here I want to quickly get to before we run out of time with you. Um, we have one question asking whether antitrust issues um, with certain companies are a part of the cyber, cyber strategy. Is that something that's being considered? Uh, by and large, uh, we avoided those issues. And Mark can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not sure we even really mentioned some of the thorny issues around uh, Section 230, which often get lumped into this uh, discussion. Um, it's not to say they aren't important. It's just that we, we couldn't address everything uh, in the report. I do think, just as a political matter, uh, just given what's happened over the last few months and just the growing antipathy um, within, uh, at least within the Republican Party or skepticism um, towards big tech and, and some of the things they're doing, I think there will be a discussion about, um, about antitrust issues uh, in, in the next Congress. Um, I have yet to see kind of a framework that makes sense myself. Uh, I'm open to it. I'm open to some sort of limited reform of, of 230 that doesn't go uh, overboard. And the other thing was we're looking at um, sort of liability of, of final goods next year, but, um, but not, not antitrust. So I guess the short answer was no, um, but I'm certain it will be a discussion in the next Congress. Okay, terrific. And Finally, if it's okay, I wanted to get this last one in. Um, someone wondered, would there be utility in resurrecting the Office of Technology Assessment 
to help more members of con Congress ramp up an understanding in the underlying issues at work here. So I have uh, I have voted in favor of that in the past. I think my Democratic colleague um, Takano has, uh, has usually does a bill every Congress to that end, and then we recommend it in in the final cyberspace solarium report. What's really interesting, and, and this is kind of an obsession of mine, uh, sort of the way in which Congress has evolved or devolved over time. If you look at that change, it was part of this, uh, a series of reforms that were done in the 90s when the Republicans regained control of Congress for the first time, I think in, in 30 years or, or maybe longer uh, under Gingrich's contract with America. And you know there was a logic to it, right? It's we're gonna we're gonna drain the swamp by getting rid of all these unelected positions in Congress, and we're gonna restore you know trust and give the American people more power. Well, the problem is by neutering tools that Congress had at its disposal, all you did was increase the power of the executive branch relative to the legislative branch. Which, if your concern is draining the swamp, it just increases the size and, and depth of the swamp. And members of Congress are always at a disadvantage when it comes to these highly technological issues. I mean, I have a staff of seven people in DC and you know, I'm not smart enough to keep up with all this stuff. So I, I think having the Office of Technological Assessment will go a long way towards getting Congress on a, on a, a level playing field with the executive branch. Um, and I just would highlight another recommendation we had in there is the creation of a, uh, a special committee uh, for cybersecurity uh, in Congress um, so that you can sort of develop that expertise within Congress over time that's able to you know, navigate the labyrinth that is the executive branch on national security and understand what's working and what isn't so we can reinforce success and stop uh, funding uh, failure. So um, that's, yeah, so yes is, I could just say yes or no in that answer your question. But <laughs> you made it all the more convincing, I suppose. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I could speak to you far longer, and I'm sure folks would be interested to hear what you have to say. But thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we all be watching the NDAA, and we will be looking to see what else emerges. So thanks for being with us. This was an absolute pleasure. And uh, I really, again, can't say enough about this effort. Uh, I. I mean, I, you know, again, you know, with the staff of seven, I have to rely upon the expertise that's out there in the think tank community. So thank you all for being part of this discussion and eager to work with all of you uh, on it going forward. Terrific. Thank you so much. I encourage you to listen to the panel and all of our listeners out there to stay on for the panel. We're going to bring um, everyone on camera so that they can join us for the second part of our discussion. Um, as they do, I'm going to go ahead and get into um, some of the introductions. Wait, so, as I sign off, can I yeah. just also highlight uh, the great work that Dr. Erica Borgard did for the commission? She was incredible in everything she contributed. And anything, anything that I wrote about this topic that seemed smart probably has her fingerprints <laughs> on it. So thank you to Erica as well. That's a great endorsement for the panelists. Thank you. All right, terrific. So we are going to move on to the panel. We have about 30 minutes. Before I kick off introductions, I want to encourage folks, please do ask questions. You see the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Type it in there. I'll keep track of that, and we're all going to have a discussion, and I'll try to make reference to those um, as we roll along. Um, so I'm going to quickly do some introductions. We have with us today Mark Montgomery. He's a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and a senior director of FD. FDD's Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation, previously served as Executive Director of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission and is currently serving as a Senior Advisor to that commission. We have Erica Borgard, who we just heard a note on, who is a resident senior fellow at Atlantic Council, focusing on the strategic implications of emerging technology. We have Nina Collars, uh, who is Associate Professor at the U.S. Naval War College and a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute at West Point. Her work focuses on cybersecurity and military in innovation. And we have Tatiana Bolton, who you heard from a little bit earlier, who is Managing Senior Fellow at the R Street Institute. So uh, welcome, everybody. I'm excited to get the conversation rolling. Um, I'm going to hop right into it so that we can utilize our time. And I am going to start with Tatiana, excuse me. Um, clearly, you know, developing 
A comprehensive ICT supply chain strategy is a massive undertaking. We heard some of the reasons, of course, from the congressman. Can you speak a little bit to the primary goals and how we balance national security with the economic interests as we as we pursue that effort? Absolutely. Um, you're Jill, you're totally right. Uh, it is a massive undertaking. Uh, but a national strategy needs to be a massive undertaking because it needs to encompass and consider so many different perspectives from e economy to national security experts to people who are experts on R&D and trade. And that's why we're bringing together scholars from a variety of different organizations and a variety of different fields, such, uh, such as those that I mentioned, as well as technology, so we can develop a holistic and feasible uh, set of concrete recommendations. Um, as you can see, we already ha have scholars who are uh, participating from R Street, FDD, the Naval War College, and Atlanta Council, and we've reached out to other organizations across the political spectrum. Um, so as we gear up for the Secure and Competitive Markets Initiative, we'll come together to decide uh, the necessary uh, values and provide a framework for weighing uh, potential policy solutions. We believe in a strong national the, a strong national strategy must defend U.S. national security, while also encouraging free market competition, because the innovation at this at that I'm sorry because the innovation that this competition fosters is one of our greatest assets in the United States. Uh, the last thing we uh, that we want would be for the United States to adopt. Uh, the last thing we would want is for the United States to adopt China's strategy of national champions and a state-directed economy, which is, in our minds, a failing strategy. Once we've agreed to that framework, uh, we'll break out into smaller groups. They'll work on issues such as precious minerals or other components in ICT equipment um, and uh, competition with China. The goal is to provide actionable policies which balance uh, economic and national security interests um, you know, to end, I will just say that we cannot cons no longer simply admire the problem. The U.S. government needs better ideas, and we believe, humbly, and with recognition that the scale of this challenge uh, is, is, is huge, that bringing together these smart and creative minds, we can begin to solve the problem. You know, it's funny, I'm going to, I'm going to, I have a question for Mark next, but I saw CISA put out a war warning on how think tanks are being targeted by phishing attacks. And I think it's all the brain power that is held by all the various think tanks around, around uh, the area. So I, you all are clearly getting targeted for a reason. Um, Mark, I wanted to jump to you because this was just mentioned by Tatiana, it was mentioned by the Congressman, that really the start of the base of the supply chain, you might say, is the raw materials. And we've heard for so long um, that China has such a dominance in terms of the rare earth industry. Um, it's used that dominance. We've seen them leverage that before, notably against Japan about a decade ago, um, though I am confident that's not the only time. Um, this has come up a lot in various government departments, Congress. I, it's hard to tell how much progress is being made. Can you kind of speak to the situation as it stands now? Yeah, thanks, Jill. And, you know, Congressman Gallagher hit on this, but, you know, I'll say kind of backing up a core aspect when we build our national cybersecurity is that the critical technologies that constitute and connect us in cyberspace, as well as the building blocks of those components, the things that go into the generators and the pumps and the valves and the switches and the servers, they have to be available to U.S. producers when we need to build things and they have to be free from compromise during their production. And the, the manufacture and production of these critical technologies, it relies on a myriad, a ton of different raw materials and intermediate goods. You know, and if our supply chains, if we can make them less complex, more local, or source to allies and partners, it's going to be far easier and more efficient for the U.S. government to, to work with companies to protect the supply chain from compromise. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we think about these raw materials, uh, the, the kind of ones that are used in high tech products, we're thinking about rare earth elements that the Congressman mentioned, um, silicon, germanium, those are two other elements. Uh, they are found all over the globe. And in the US even mines some of them, and we even extract these materials from mined products. But more often than not, increasingly, even despite the Japanese example, um, the US relies on other countries for their refinement and, uh, and, and we end up importing them. Um, our greatest shortfall is those rare earth elements, though. I, to, I don't want to get, you know, they've got weird names like 
uh, lanthanium and samarium and such, but what they do is they kind of get the conductivity of the of the um, of the material, the the um, emanate material better. They they allow hardware to have special properties that give you peak performance. Uh, these aren't found in abundance in the U.S. These rare earth elements, and without them, it leaves us a critical uh, dependence when you're thinking about. Um, semiconductors, uh, the display panels that use touch panels, functionality, improved radio transmission, all the fiber optics, you know, really the stuff that goes into our military weapon systems, you know, like the chips inside precision guided munitions like El Razum and Navy weapon systems, they all rely on these rare earth elements for critical components. And what's really happened is, is while we could mine some of these, the extraction of the, of the rare earth element from the ores is, in a, real, is a really costly process and it causes considerable environmental damage. So for these reasons, the United States has really come to rely on China. They've taken advantage of their lower production costs, their government subsidy, subsidies, and much, much, much fewer environmental restrictions to take a leadership position worldwide in this. So I, I know the Congressman said, hey, we gotta take a look at this. So what I would say is when we take a look at it and what the art of the possible is, we're gonna have to expand our vision beyond the US because to address some of those issues I mentioned about the cost of production and the environmental impacts, we're really gonna to have to rely on reliable partners in Asia and Europe, some of whom have already started working on this. And to correct this dependency, it's not gonna be cheap and it won't be fast. Um, but you know, the truth is I don't mind buying my sneakers in China. I'd be really concerned about buying the raw materials for El Razum missiles and things like that from China. So we're gonna to have to fix this. It's just, it isn't gonna be a real quick change to the NDA and we're, and we're in business. This is a tens of billions of dollars issue and a lot of environmental work and understanding whether we're doing it in the United States or with our partners and allies. And probably years. I mean, you have to imagine when you think of both the financial and the production side of things, not to mention the agreements that would probably be needed with international partners. So there could be reliance on China for some time, no? A decade. You know, I, I think realistically, if we put our mind, if we put good American ingenuity our good relationships with allies and partners who've already started this. This is a decade long issue and tens of billions of dollars. By the way, there's a, if you go one step up into the intermediate goods like microchips, um, that's another billions and decade long. We're in a fight there, we're in the game, but to stay in the game is a tens of billions of dollars of investment issue. So these, these are really complex, hard things that aren't gonna be fixed by one or two senators thinking, whoa, they might put this in my district or my state and we'll be okay. This is a really a national security challenge. And it's, I'm gonna circle back to everyone on aspects of that because I think a lot of it comes down to a money problem too, which Congress I don't think is entirely willing to pony up in terms of the kind of investment that's, that's required for so many of these aspects. But first I wanna really quickly um, you know, hear from all of our panelists. I want Erica perhaps um, to chat with us in terms of ICT and supply chain generally tends to be focused on the economics. This came up with the Congressman as well, market share, competition, um, that sort of scenario, but are there military implications and what might those be? Yeah, thanks, Jill. I think that's a great question. And Mark, um, you know, kind of alluded to this just in his remarks a few minutes ago. Um, you know, I do think there's an important military dimension to these issues and the way that I see it, um, I, I think they're kind of two sides to this challenge. Um, and the first one is perhaps like the more obvious one, right? The fact that compromises or vulnerabilities or fragility in the DOD supply chain has national security consequences, right? Um, you know, uh, vulnerabilities in hardware or software could provide an avenue for adversaries to conduct espionage, um, to distort the functioning of systems at critical times. Um, you know, as Mark also mentioned, right, the fact that overseas dependence on critical technologies and also critical material um, could enable adversaries to cut off the DOD from access to them during a time of crisis or even for its own, for their own coercive bargaining purposes, right, not just for, um, you know, uh, war fighting or crisis scenarios, but just for their own strategic ends. Um, and I think that we've all become a bit more aware of the salience of this issue during this because of COVID-19, but the reality is that it predates the pandemic. Um, and that's why, you know, from my perspective, I think it will be really important to develop 
a systemic process for identifying what those critical technologies and capabilities for the DOD are, which will be part of this effort that we're all kind of um, kicking off here today. Um, and then developing a strategy that is based on partnerships, especially international partnerships, to build this sort of trusted network of suppliers. Um, you know, and for the DOD also, the private sector plays an enormous role here in a way that we don't always intuitively think about. Um, and it's, you know, obviously the defense industrial base, right? Um, which is why any strategy for the DOD um, and securing the DOD supply chain has to be organized around the public-private partnership, which is not a sort of natural framework for thinking about military challenges. Um, but the reality is that the DOD doesn't have a complete picture of its supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no sort of mechanism for making that happen without a public-private framework that's based on some combination of both requirements and incentives. Um, and then sort of relatedly, um, I think a lot of people don't realize the role that um, commercial off-the-shelf technology plays in, um, you know, in, in military capabilities. And, you know, the F-35, for instance, relies on commercial off-the-shelf um, IoT technology for its sensor capabilities. And we all know about the vulnerabilities in IoT devices, right? Um, you know, there have been uh, recent DOD Inspector General reports that have shown that DOD continues to purchase um, commercial off-the-shelf technology that, that has been shown to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's, there's this sort of not only an international partnership dimension, but also a public-private um, partnership dimension that's important. And so that's kind of, that's one sort of big slice of the issue. Um, I think the other side that is less um, that doesn't get as much attention is the implications for war fighting in terms of sort of what the global ecosystem of information and communications technology looks like. And that's where I see a really interesting intersection between the economic aspects, right? Like who has the relative global market share of ICT technologies and then the military aspects and how they intersect. So um, you know, when we think a good example of this is 5G, right, but there are other examples. Um, 5G technology will inevitably change the environment in which the US military and its allies and partners are operating. And this creates lots of good opportunities, right? You can improve situational awareness of battlefield commanders, you can improve the volume and the speed with which information is shared across between dispersed units, you can improve precision targeting capabilities. Um, but there are also risks. Um, especially in terms of the ability of the U.S. and our allies and partners to operate despite or through adversary efforts to disrupt or deny or degrade telecommunications and the associated military capabilities that rest on that infrastructure in a given area of operations anywhere in the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, since the Persian Gulf War, commanders have become increasingly reliant on technical means of intelligence gathering at the tactical level. Um, and the reality is that if China, for instance, takes the lead in fielding these um, ICT systems around the world, then the US and our allies and partners will be operating in an environment where China has sort of shaped the telecommunications ecosystem. And so I think this has important implications for warfighting that we don't you know, naturally think about. Um, and so um, you know, I'm, I'm leave it to the other panelists to, uh, to share their thoughts on the military implications. I know Nina has some thoughts on this too, but those are sort of the two kind of big issues that I see in terms of framing the military challenges. Yeah. And Nina, I would like to hear from you. I mean, there was lots of mention there from Erica in terms of partners. And like I mentioned in the earlier conversation with Representative Gallagher, you know, China is trying to win those partners and allies over um, as well. And they have um, what some might call a strong argument to do so from the economic side of things. So how does that fit? And long term, when you look at all of these issues, you know, it really has the potential to shift the geopolitical nature of our, our military position around the world. So how does all of that fit into this conversation in terms of how we how we coordinate with allies around yeah. the world? I, I can't I can't say enough like if I couldn't it, it's always fun to convene a panel where we're all talking about some subset of the part of an elephant but ultimately we sort of agree it's an elephant right and that's just sort of reassuring all the way around and so I think 
Um, I mean, one, just to elevate a little bit of what Erica was talking about, I, you know, I was, I was in Venezuela, uh, sorry, I wasn't in Venezuela, I was in Argentina last year, and, um, and a good chunk of, of that country's ICT is a gift from China, right? And that seems fine, except I'm there sort of as part of a, of a U.S. naval diplomatic move to sort of talk about how we can be uh, sort of integrate better with their military. And so, you know, if we're going to be integrating with their military in a space where the Chinese own the ICT, it's a very interesting and complicated thing. Yeah. Um, but as far as partners and allies are concerned, I want to be clear that I'm talking mostly about DOD's corner of the universe, right? So like there's all sorts of partners and allies questions when it comes to global trade or when it comes to marketplaces or you know, just consumer space stuff. But when I'm talking specifically about DOD, we're talking mostly, um, one of the things we don't talk enough about is what do we think we mean by trust, right? And so, um, I mean, so the, I'm part of what's called the, the Cyber and Innovation Policy Institute the Naval War College. And one of the things we're trying to look at is uh, trust, not just in the technology or the supply, and supply chain itself, but what's integral to any sort of strategy like this is to think about trust in our global partners and allies themselves. Right, so we have the Five Eyes partnerships, we have our relationships with the UK. And one of the things that we really need to be thinking about is how does that, what's the status of that trust? How do we make it better, right? Um, and, and, that's, and that's part of what is incredibly important for the safety and security and health of the capacity for the United States to project power. So, I mean, so everyone agrees that we need friends to, to fight, right? But we also need friends to build and secure. And that means getting beyond hardware and software, and mapping supply chains, all of it is really important. And it's you can see as our as the colleagues on the panel talk, we're all talking about different parts of this. But we we also, in, in addition to thinking, um, how do we do partnerships, as Erica was talking about, with our private sector, the down and in, the how do we do better by our own markets, how do we make our own companies more competitive? We do need to be thinking up and out, right? With whom can we develop trust? With whom do we have trust now militarily? What do we have for technology exchanges? What can we do better and more? And Mark was talking about a potential relationship with Vietnam. These are very important questions that we need to think strategically. We can't be slapdash or sloppy about it because, because trust in an ally is trust, right? And so we need to think about with whom and why is that important. We have to do it not just because we want to be friendly with the rest of the world, right? There's a certain kind of credibility that comes with having military hard power. Um, it's a stabilizing factor, not just a destabilizing factor, right? Having military hard power is a stabilizing factor in world politics. And so the capacity to have it, to secure it, to, to make it function correctly is part of this, this capacity. The United States has a vision of what it thinks the international system needs to be and its role in it. And so part of what has to happen here is we need to think broader than just down and in consumer marketplace, partially because defense spending, the defense acquisitions process is a tiny, tiny sliver of the broader consumer marketplace, right? It's a unique market. And that unique market, the DOD is, you know, it has a lot of money, right? But it's, it's, a, it's a unique minority stakeholder in the marketplace, in the broader marketplace. So how do we get, how do we get the United States to be more effective, the, the government, the, the DOD be more effective in flexing its requirements to be secure for the stuff that the DOD needs? we need partners to scale, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we need to be thinking about is how do we reach out to our partners and allies across the world? How do we get our pieces to be interoperable? How do we secure it, not just for us? And it can't be just a US only supply chain story. That's, I mean, it, in my opinion, it would be impossible, right? DOD produced only by the United States, it's impossible. So we need to start thinking about how do we scale this up? And that's what we need our partners and allies for. So it's not just about the machines themselves. We need to think about how do we foster these long-term relationships with our global partners and allies who have a similar vision about the about the, the international stage and where we belong in it? Yeah, and that's easier said than done when you consider a couple of factors. We talked about commercial offerings. Um, DOD has tried um, repeatedly and continues to try to work more um, with commercial partners in a way that mirrors some of how they do business um, in terms of development. They're not always successful in that because of some of the um, restrictions in terms of procurement and, and otherwise. And then what we're seeing a lot around the world is domestic, a focus on domestic growth of the industrial base. The U.S. has 
kind of focused at home for um, the, this administration, but other countries have started to do the same. Australia was mentioned, for example, and we just did a interview with the former prime minister that spoke about needing to grow the domestic capabilities in cybersecurity. So what needs to happen? We talked about funding. We talked about incentives. Um, you know, with a new administration you know, likely coming in, where do the priorities have to be to kind of move this plan forward to enable it? Because we've been talking about it for a long time. And that's to anybody. I'm, I'm directing this at, at the whole group. If I, I will say, I will say uh, one thing. I think what's what's important in this initiative, and and certainly from the R Street perspective, what we want to do is not necessarily focus entirely on the U.S. Um, uh, market and uh, our producers, manufacturers, and companies, but a uh, international sort of partnership uh, with with other partners and allies that uh, creates a more competitive global marketplace for all of these ICT products that that can compete, uh, like uh, Representative Gallagher said, not only in quality, but in price. And we can only do that with partners and allies. Um, uh, Joaquin Ryder from Vodafone uh, today at the Aspen Cyber Summit uh, said that optionality is, is the critical piece here. We can't, on the one hand, suggest that the United States um, get out of any relationships and remove all Chinese products from our supply chain, while not also creating that op the optionality for companies and uh, consumers to move to another secure product. If we cannot get into these markets and, and uh, manufacture these goods ourselves or with partners and allies, we're not going to be able to convince uh, others to, to take these moves because while security is important and critical, uh, you need to consider the resiliency of the, of the networks and systems as well. And that is not possible without that optionality. Yeah, so what's the incentive for companies to start moving towards the R&D that would really be necessary for this? Does government, do agencies, does Congress, need to step in and you know provide financial benefits to to this happening are they doing that now do they need to do more anyone uh, i would say well this is that's going to be a very hard issue because it really depends on what's the normal business case if there's a normal business case for r d investment we'd expect companies to do that the right. problem comes when you have an extraordinary case and, and i think we're seeing this in the um the Foundries Act and the Protect Act, the um, the, the, the um, semiconductor uh, acts that are in that went in, they were in the Congress initially, and then went into the NDA. And what you saw initially was the kind of money that's really required. By the time it comes out of the authorization, it'll be in the single billions, and then by the time it gets down with appropriators, we'll be lucky if it's a billion. Mm -hmm. So in reality, you didn't solve the problem. Um, I'd step back one more and say, we really need to have a strategic approach. You know, our government is a can-do organization, even though if can-do appears to take too long and not do the right thing, there is an attempt at can-do. The problem we got right now is we have a lot of can-do going on in terms of both legislatively with acts like, you know, the Founders Act, the Protect Act, the Open Radio Access Network Act, and in agencies where you have DHS, DOD, Commerce, all shooting off with strategies and, and lines of effort. What you don't see is a strategic you know, kind of guidance that kind of makes sure that you've identified what are the key technologies and equipment. It's not everything. It's a thing that government experts you know, believe are necessary to defend ourselves. And then you have to decide what's the minimum you, you have to have. Because it might be that between ourselves and our partners, we're okay. I mean, it's not perfect, but there's it's it's there. And then once you determine that maybe you're below that minimum capability or capacity, that's when you start to turn on the gears of Amer you know, of of government intervention, whether it's incentivizing or regulating, or um, or or, uh, or finding a a good overseas source resource to do it. That's when the government, I think, gets engaged. But we're we're shoot, you know, we're we're ready, you know, fire aim on a lot of these efforts. So I'm really hoping that the Biden administration sits back on this and comes up with a comprehensive critical technology industrial strategy 
and then and looks at those clean elements and figures the way out of this. But you know, generally speaking, that can-do attitude translates into get it done too fast. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm looking at uh, the Biden administration coming in. We've seen we've seen the relationship with China shift pretty dramatically um, over the last four years. Um, it was very different from the Obama administration. Like, and some might say China as a threat has shifted um, over the course of the last four years as well. So. How should the China policy be framed by the um, by the Biden administration going in to help enable this? Any thoughts there? Seeing who might want to. Well, share. I, I'll jump in one more time and just say I, I, I think Congressman Gallagher kind of averred to this. Yeah. It's we, we are in a competition, and even if sometimes we don't understand we're in a competition or don't act like we're in a competition. You know, my, I've been observing, I think Erica has as well, China for 15 or 20 years in my case, and they certainly know it and act like it. And that competition has resulted, you know, um, you know, in, in the United States competing in, in a not free and not fair um, trade environment. What I mean by this is, you know, they've used a mix of government-led industrial policy, not that there's anything wrong with that, but with deceptive trade practices and state-led intellectual property theft, there is a problem with that. The manipulation of international standards and trade bodies, there is a problem with that. And then an investment in research and development, and there's not a problem with that. So they've mixed, used this mix of ethical or unethical, legal or unethical methods to create a very difficult environment for our companies. I think we have to recognize we're in that competitive environment. That doesn't mean we're going to war with them. It doesn't, but it does mean we're probably in a longer term strategic com uh, competition than we tend to hope we're in. And so I, I, that's how I look at it. And that might be slightly pessimistic, but I think that's the a proper way to begin your strategic approach. No, that's, that's great. And I think uh, too much optimism can sometimes stall progress um, in my opinion and has shown to. Um, unfortunately, we are at time. So I do want to thank all of our panelists for sharing really terrific perspective. This is such an important topic. Um, I think there's zero question that step one is to develop a really strong strategy. Um, and then it's really about of finding the best approach for implementing that. So um, we will be very interested to keep an eye on how this moves forward and to hear more as efforts continue, um, both in government and throughout all of all of your organizations. So we thank you for that. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today for this important conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks to Tatiana for pulling this together. Yeah. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody.